Yes, uh, we think about getting over the uh, issues that nature presents with us. But I like to think of this project especially as using these kind of technologies to better understand how we can live in nature. Uh, so, like I said, we're focusing on a very local analysis. Uh, what I have on the left is a picture of the FCAT Reserve in Northwest Ecuador, which is about 80 kilometers squared. Uh, we're going to be focusing on this uh, small area of the rainforest so we can get a really accurate picture of what local factors are actually happening here and then provide that specific information to the local populations. And so my three objectives are one, uh, classification using high resolution imagery from planet imagery as a way to classify land cover and understand uh, the, what's driving land cover. Two, understanding, look into factors driving the land cover change and quantifying that pattern. We'll be working with um, different tiles from different periods of time and quantifying how those land cover patterns have changed after classifying them. And then lastly is to communicate, to visualize this information into a cohesive map and identify key areas for conservation for not only FCAT, but for uh, local populations in the rainforest to understand and look at. Uh, the methods that I will be using, uh, one classification, so using an object-oriented manual classification to convert planet imagery into land class uh, GIS layers. Uh, next, understanding social factors with existing socioeconomic data that um, the Caribbean Lab and FCAT have already gathered to understand what is driving the landscape changes in the different periods of time that we're studying. Um, next will be gra ground truthing. Uh, the Caribbean Lab is planning on sending a team of biology gra grad students there in July, I believe, to take some on-site measurements of the habitat, and then we'll be using that to correct the map and make sure that everything is accurate. And then lastly, a biodiversity analysis to identify key areas for conservation and other areas for potential development. The outcomes of this project will be one, a cohesive map that provides a detailed land cover to communicate to all the relevant uh, populations and groups in this project. Uh, two, increased community engagement by having this map and having this information kind of in the public sphere. We hope to encourage local stakeholders to take part in conservation as well as understand how on their own land they can contribute to local biodiversity conservation. Um, and then lastly, informed ecotourism. I will be working with Madeline Bertinoli, who is another junior here and is working with the IAC. She presented on Wednesday about her plot, but she's also working with Ethica and we are planning on uh, coming. She's coming up with a business model for sustainable ecotourism. And then I will be delineating certain areas that can be used for ecotourism. All right, and then lastly, the overall significance of the project. Um, there's kind of four goals that I have. One is to understand human environment relationships as a very key component in landscape change. Uh, two, to further understand how we can classify landscape uh, landscapes with high resolution imagery and just contribute to that growing field of knowledge. Uh, next is to encourage sustainable landscape development while protecting biodiversity and contribute to the understanding that they don't have to be mutually exclusive. Um, and then lastly, apply all of these land cover classifications and ecological knowledge to identify those areas for ecotourism. And then lastly, I just want to say thank you to uh, all my conservation partners and all of you for listening. Yes, thank you so much. Um, does anyone have a brief question? Well, feel free if you have a question to put in the chat, but we're going to go ahead. Ella, there is one in the chat. Oh, it's a crash. Um, yeah, so will what is the final um, product for this? Will the final product be in multiple languages um, due to the nature of your study area? That is a very good question. I had worked a little bit with FCAT um, to talk about like how interviews and everything is going to work. They're planning on conducting those and actually working with them. I do you think it, it's going to be a good idea to have at least some sort some level of translation for um, people there? So, yeah. Thanks for the question. Alrighty, that's a great question. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to. Can you see my screen? Okay. Good. Okay, so um, my name is Miriam. I'm a junior at the college and I'm majoring in biology, and I'm working with the Wildlife Conservation Society to develop um, sea level rise projections to show its effects on seagrasses. 
Um, I'm being advised by Robert Rose and Professor Matthias Lloyd. So thank you so much. So the Wildlife Conservation Society or WCS aims to conserve species and places around um, 14 regions they've identified as being the most biodiverse across the world. And Mesoamerica is one of those regions and they've worked with regional programs um, in the past on terrestrial conservation and now they're shifting gears and focusing on the marine strategy. And so they've identified seagrasses as critical to that plan. So seagrasses are flowering plants known to be the lungs of the sea because they provide oxygen to plenty of organisms and they're deeply rooted in the sediments of the coastline and the shore. Um, and that provides a home for um, plenty of fish and plenty of other organisms and local peoples depend on fish for their own livelihoods. And so lots of fish are concentrated in these areas. But unfortunately, climate change and sea level rise is changing that because as the world warms, um, sea level also rises and that um, creates um, bad conditions for seagrasses to thrive. And so it's critical to predict where the sea level rise will happen and how much it will occur um, so that we can protect these species that depend on seagrasses and also um, help support the local peoples there. So where do we start? We're gonna be looking at the Western Caribbean ecosystem. We're gonna be looking at the Atlantic portions of Belize, Honduras, Guatemala, Venezuela, and um, Nicaragua. And we're looking at the Atlantic portions of these coastlines because um, seagrass beds are typically found there. So this is a figure from a seagrass extinction risk assessment from 2011 that shows the species richness in figure A. Um, where it shows that there isn't that much seagrass diversity in the Western Caribbean, which is good because we're gonna be focusing on a few species. And then it also shows in figure B how threatened seagrasses are. So NT stands for near threatened, VU is vulnerable, EN is endangered. And so we can see from this figure that the Western Caribbean has seagrasses that are near threatened. Um, and um, this final figure in figure C, it shows um, seagrass decline. So purple indicates that there is decline in seagrasses and that's what we can see in the Western Caribbean. So my project will be developing a sea level rise projection under the worst possible scenario of global warming. So um, a 2.5 degree increase in the average global temperatures by 2100. And so this is an example of something that I would kind of do where um, I would be looking at different factors that um, contribute to sea level rise and develop maps accordingly to see where the sea level will rise and by how much um, over the course of 10 years. And so this 10 year projection is really important um, so that um, they can try and mitigate effects early on and develop a, a plan for now so that they can um, prevent any um, decline in the next 10 years. And the last thing I will do is um, gather marine protected areas maps from local authorities in those five countries. Um, and marine protected areas are areas that the local authorities have identified that has critical species that need to be protected. And so by layering a map, over my sea level rise projections, I can show where seagrasses are not included. And so this could help them redefine what marine protected areas are. And if they are included, then we could take the appropriate steps to um, solve the problem and, and mitigate the effects of, of sea level rise and climate change. And like I mentioned before, this is really critical to the Wildlife Conservation Society because um, these sea level projections they can use to identify other species that might be affected by sea level rise and they can act accordingly and develop a strategy for those species. And this can also leverage grassroots efforts to transition the local peoples into a blue economy. So thank you to the Wildlife Conservation Society and thank you to Rob and thank you to Professor, Professor Matthias Floy for um, advising me on this project. Thank you so much. Um, I think there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, as sea level rises, is it possible for the location of sea grass beds to migrate? Um, or is once there's a lack of suitable habitat, um, they go away? So sea grasses, um, they thrive in shallow waters. And um, if the sea level rises too much, the sun can't penetrate um, into the 
see enough so that the seagrasses can um, oxygenate and provide um, or photosynthesize to provide oxygen. So um, according to my research, I don't think they migrate, but they probably would just die off. Um, so the conditions of sea level rise and climate change would um, stop their, their growth, I guess, because now since the sea level has risen, less light can penetrate, algae can grow on top, so there's not enough light to penetrate, if that makes sense. Yeah, interesting. Um, all right, thank you so much for your presentation. We're gonna thank go you. ahead um, and continue. Our next presenter um, is Emilio Luis Rica um, on the implement implementation of deep learning for crane monitoring. Emilio, um, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right, oh, come on. There we are. Um, can you see that okay? Yep. Great. So uh, I am Emilio. I am a majoring in data science and I'm working with US Fish and Wildlife Service and USGS uh, to kind of um, help streamline the monitoring of sandhill cranes um, by using deep learning. I uh, wanted to just thank US Fish, USGS, uh, and the Institute for Integrative Conservation for this, this opportunity. It's already been a lot of fun. I've already learned a lot. Uh, really looking forward to the research over the summer. So getting right to it, uh, what is kind of this counting critters problem statement? Very basically, we uh, capture population estimates by just counting an animal, um, which is which was pretty, pretty simple. Um, a nice efficient way to do this generally is with aerial methods, um, because we can kind of capture a, a large spatial extent uh, very quickly, certainly much more quickly than if we were to say drive or walk. Um, in our case, uh, we are counting sandhill cranes uh, on, at the Platte River, which is in Nebraska, and this is on their spring migration path. Um, it's kind of an optimal point to capture their population because it's a point at which they kind of uh, congregate. And uh, then with that, we can go ahead and regulate hunting uh, and guide policy and any necessary interventions to make sure that uh, sandhill, sandhill crane populations in North America are staying kind of at a stable, reasonable level. Um, how have we been doing this? Uh, we've been using these ocular aerial transect surveys, which is a total mouthful, uh, but it's pretty simple. Basically, we have these planned flight paths, uh, and, and so we fly over these kind of planned lines called transects, and then observers in the plane will kind of count all of the animals that they see within a predefined distance from the plane. So maybe they'll fly 200 meters um, you know, above ground and then count all uh, cranes within 100 meters of the plane. Um, and, and this works pretty well. We've been doing it for like the last 30 years and it's, it's been getting the job done for a yearly survey, but we definitely wanna, there are some kind of downsides that we would like to um, kind of eliminate uh, with, with, with a new procedure. Uh, those downsides being that it's sample based. So we're not kind of counting all the cranes in, in our region of interest, just some of them, and then kind of using statistics uh, and other methodologies to inflate to a population estimate. Um, it's very laborious. Uh, there's kind of a lot of points at which it requires a lot of human effort. Uh, and certainly kind of the biggest one is that, that we have these observers in the plane counting the cranes themselves. Uh, and then the flights are quite low, so it can be dangerous for flight crews. Uh, they, they may only be flying maybe 100 meters um, above the ground. Um, so kind of what are we moving towards? Um, a brief aside, what, what happens kind of with these deep learning models in general? Uh, on the left of that dotted line, I have just kind of a very basic schematic. Um, and so what's happening kind of at a very high level is that we have a model that takes as input something. Uh, here I have pictures, so pictures of cats and dogs maybe. And then the model, which is that kind of red box, will do something to synthesize that data and then make a prediction. Um, and so I have, uh, I have this set up as a classification problem where you give it an input picture of a cat or dog and it'll say, okay, that's a picture of a cat, that's a picture of a dog. Um, on, the, on the right side of that dotted line, I have something kind of more specific to our use case with this kind of counting critters problem statement where the input is a thermal aerial image uh, it passes through this model. It's going to do some synthesis, and with some kind of fancy uh, math and statistics, we kind of output output uh, our prediction. And our prediction is in the form of this thing called a bounding box, 
which you can see it's that blue box on that bottom right image, uh, which basically uh, is where the model is predicting is an animal in that picture. So in, in that example, that's a koala and that's a, that's a graphic that I lifted from one of the papers in the literature. And so kind of these techniques have been proven to work pretty well. Um, and, and the big thing now is just translating what's been done and what's been proven to work well kind of in the literature over into practice, actually getting, you know, getting it to work for us in a management context. Um, and so we've already collected data, uh, which is pretty exciting. It happened in mid-March. Uh, and this is kind of a sample of what our data looks like, thermal aerial imagery over, over the Platte River of these cranes. And you can see I have defined one crane there with that, that, uh, that kind of neon green bounding box. So they're pretty small. You get kind of an idea of, of the difficulty of this task here. Um, and we have kind of a range of heights uh, that, they, that they flew at, US Fish and USGS. And so now we kind of have a lot to, to work with and try out. And, um, and so kind of moving towards our objectives, uh, we really want to implement these tools practically, um, kind of take what's been done in the literature and, and see if we can do it practically. Does it still work in, in a little bit more of a messy, less controlled uh, environment? Um, and, and if it does work, we want to set up for a full inventory in the future, collect a bunch of imagery, push it through the model, and the model will produce the counts rather than humans producing the counts. And then um, so kind of a big part of that, a big part of getting towards that goal is just kind of figuring out the methodology uh, kind of needs to be um, and, and how we need to process data, collect data, uh, et cetera, in order to get good results. Um, and so in terms of the, the local impact, uh, the left side of that dotted line is the scope of this project where we will collect our whole data set, fly kind of the entire region of interest, get a bunch of thermal imagery, push it through the model, and then our result and kind of what we hope to get to at the end of this project is a total crane count. Maybe there are 300,000 cranes in, in the imagery and that's our population estimate. In terms of moving forward uh, and what does that mean in the, in the context of things with the management of, of crane, crane species in the United States, um, we'd like to kind of use those population estimates as a kind of a, a, um, a way of tracking how the population is doing. And, and like I said, eventually using that to ensure that we are interacting with cranes sustainably uh, and hopefully in a more efficient, uh, more accurate uh, manner and also maybe less dangerous for flight crews because we can fly a little higher. Where does that fit in broadly? Um, well, there are a couple exciting things uh, with this project, but one of them is, um, you know, here we're, we're doing something that hasn't been done practically really yet. And so kind of what we learn here should translate pretty well to other projects, um, kind of being able to define kind of the guidelines for what you need to do to get, to get these techniques working for you in practice. And then one other thing is um, these models, uh, these deep learning models tend to kind of transfer from task to task relatively well. So it's not unreasonable to think that if we can train up a model that does really well in this task on counting sandal cranes in aerial thermal imagery, uh, maybe if we, uh, wanted to count uh, herons or eagles, or I have a polar bear there, which might be a little far-fetched, but uh, if we collected a little bit more data, fine-tuned our model and kind of retrained it, we might be able to get to that, uh, which would really streamline the process, um, you know, it, not just for sandal cranes, but for a variety of at-risk species of interest. Uh, so super exciting stuff. I'm really excited to pursue the research over the summer, and uh, thanks for coming out. Um, one question in the chat, um, what do you think will give you the largest false positive problem from these images? Um, sure. Um, we've been thinking about that a lot and kind of how are we going to make sure the model is robust. Um, one of the biggest problems is uh, at peak when we would want to capture that, that estimate when there are the most sandal cranes there uh, on the plat. Um, there is kind of a good deal of what we call non-targets. So there are kind of uh, mixed in with sandhill cranes. We have ducks and uh, geese. And so unfortunately in our data, we didn't capture that many non-targets. We have mostly sandhill cranes. And so what that's probably gonna mean here is that the model we produce from this year's data is not gonna be able to uh, kind of differentiate. It just doesn't have the data to learn from. And so it's really only gonna be able to say, this is a sandal crane and it will probably get confused. It's probably going to get pretty confused when it sees other things that aren't sandal cranes, but look a heck of a lot like sandal cranes. 
Um, and then how does scale of imagery collection um, impact clustering um, versus individual counts um, in this project? Um, yeah, so, so I, I'm not sure I completely understand the, the question here. Um, we're, we're kind of going for an approach that is, um, I, I say previous approaches would, would take, um, if I'm understanding, would take this, 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 uh, this kind of statistical approach where, where you might um, kind of hold the hand of the model a little bit more. You say, okay, well, we see sandal cranes clustering in this manner. And so maybe, maybe we can kind of eliminate some false positives because, because we know that this grouping of birds is, is, is indicative of a sandal crane cluster. Um, unfortunately, we're not kind of going for that approach um, because we want something that's a little bit more robust, a little bit more translatable, transferable to other tasks. And so um, maybe after the fact, we'll look at kind of the detections and clean it up by uh, by saying, okay, this looks like a sandal crane cluster. Um, but, but just in terms of the deep learning model, we kind of don't know what features it's going to learn. We just hope to kind of give it the data that is going to be the most effective for its learning process and then go from there and see kind of what we have to do to clean up estimates. Thank you so much. Um, moving on to the next presentation, our next presenter is Sidoni Korn. She'll be presenting on land use intensity in Bogdan, Mongolia. So Sidoni, um, we're excited for your presentation. I'm Sidoni Horn, and my project is Land Use Intensity in Bodkan National Park, Mongolia, balancing economic development with preserving the world's oldest protecting, protected area. I'm working on this project with uh, Rob Rose through the IIC, as well as uh, Kirk Olson from Wildlife Conservation Society, Mongolia, and Anudari Bayarkangi, who's a student at National University, Mongolia. So, Broadly, the issue is that balancing human needs and environmental needs is at the core of integrative conservation. Often these goals are at odds with each other, especially when it comes to modernization and economic development, um, bumping into environmental preservation. In Mongolia, the shift towards urban development began in the 1990s following the fall of communism. While under a communist government, private land ownership was not allowed. And so after the collapse of that government, people were quick to privately buy up land, which increased the value of that land and um, led to a shift towards developing it. Shifting away from the communist agricultural model also led to an increased focus on different types of industry, especially mining. All these transitions have had a positive effect on Mongolia's economy, with the current GDP nearly 700 times that of 1990. However, these mechanisms for improving the economy have also led to increased urbanization in areas like Ulaanbaatar, as pictured, that are beginning to encroach on protected natural landscapes. Um, this is from, these pictures are from a video um, posted of Ulaanbaatar in 1993 and 2015, and you can see just how much more urbanization and development has occurred in that time period and the surrounding open spaces. Some research has already been done on the effects of this shift towards industrial society um, in Mongolia and especially around Ulaanbaatar. However, most of this research has focused on the impact, most of this re research has focused on the impact on the existing, existing urban environment and how the city itself is developing. While Mongolia in general is experiencing an increase in urban sprawl, there was a lack of road infrastructure around Ulaanbaatar, which has concentrated the development in that city to be a higher density. This has prevented some sprawl, but the boundaries of the developed land are still continuing to push outwards. Uh, additionally, the basin geography around Ulaanbaatar has made it a prime area for concentrating pollutants, and that has increased the pollutant levels around the city, which can have dangerous effects on both the people and the plants and animals in nearby protected areas like Bodkan Ul National Park, directly south of Ulaanbaatar. Um, so just south of Ulaanbaatar, which is the capital city of Mongolia, is Bodkan. This is the oldest protected area in the world. Bodkan Ul National Park has been under some form of government protection since the 18th century. The request for protected status was initially made to maintain the mountain's beauty and relevance as a religious area for public worship. 
Now, Boj Khan is protected under Mongolia's modern tiered protected area system, where it's designated as a strictly protected area, which is the highest level of protection. Despite its historical significance and explicit protections, the park is still dependent on political whims. As management changes, people bring in different priorities for the park's use, some of which may not have environmental health in mind. Additionally, the outer parts of the park are in a less, under less stringent protections, which leaves them more vulnerable to encroachment as Yuan Batar expands. The goals of this project is to answer two questions. First, how has the land cover and land use changed over the past 30 years? Once we have a baseline for what change has occurred, we want to figure out why. Our second question addresses that issue. We'll be looking at how changes in the political landscapes and economic priorities correlate with the land use land cover changes we expect to find. So far, no research has been done on land cover change in Vogue Conwell. Therefore, the results from this project will give us new information about the park and the effects of urbanization near natural landscapes. Additionally, looking further into the policy and management can give us some insight on the effectiveness of protected area um, land policy. A brief overview of our methods. To answer the first question of what the land use land cover change has been, we'll be mapping these patterns over uh, the changes from 1990 to 2020 using Landsat images. Once we've developed these maps, we'll also work with the part of the team that is actually in Ulaanbaatar uh, to visit some of the sites so we can ground truth the data that we have. We'll also be creating a timeline of changes in political power and policy so we can see how those line up how those changes line up with the changes we're seeing, if we're seeing changes in our um, land cover maps. There is also this research are directly applicable to the management of both Conwell. They can help inform future management decisions by serving as support of how past management decisions have affected the park. This can help ensure that the positive development in the economy and industry around Ulaanbaatar does not negatively impact Mongolia's nat natural treasures. On a broader scale, protected areas around the world are threatened by increased urbanization and development. These protected areas provide countless benefits to the environment as well as to people's health and are often homes to cultural heritage. Once lost, it can be nearly impossible to restore such natural habitat. Information from this study can help inform management of protected areas in different parts of the world that are facing similar pressures of development. Great job. Thank you so much. Um, is there, do you know of any data that is available about socioeconomic indicators of people land parcels um, that are in the localities um, to the park? Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head. I. I know that when they were putting in the policies they have, something they took into account was how um, a lot of people's like local economies were dependent on like collecting materials from the park. And when putting in protections, they part of the reason for the tiered system was to ensure that while protecting the area, they you weren't completely removing um, some people's like economic livelihoods. Um, so a little bit of that. That was great. Um, all right, getting into our next presentation. Our next presenter is Maddie Maris, um, who will uh, present on the impact of grassland restoration on priority bird species. So, Maddie. All right, hi everyone. Um, so my name is Maddie. I'm a junior here at William and Mary, double majoring in biology and environmental science. Um, and today I'm going to be presenting on the research that I'll be conducting this summer, working with the IAC and the American Bird Conservancy to assess North Texas grassland restoration effectiveness using remote sensing. So to start off, this, these lovely guys here are the uh, Northern Bobwhite Quail. They're an iconic game species found in the um, North American grassland systems, especially in Texas grassland systems where my research is focused. 
Unfortunately, due to habitat fragmentation and habitat degradation, their population has decreased 77% in the past 20 years. And if we don't make competent, strong conservation changes now, that will just continue. This is a little bit of background on the grassland systems in North America. Grasslands actually cover a large portion of the United States. Something that's very important about grasslands is the heterogeneity of the landscape. So that means you have a mixture of trees and shrubs and a variety of grasses that allow for a diversity of species to call this landscape home. Um, there's a lot of niches available that different species can fill. Unfortunately, since the arrival of European settlers, these grasslands have been systematically destroyed through changing to cattle ranching and agricultural fields to the point where a lot of the animals that once called grasslands home no longer have that habitat, or if the habitat still does exist, it exists in a fragmented state that doesn't allow for the true size needed to support these species. This has especially affected birds, which is the subject of my research especially. On the left is the Eastern Meadowlark. Um, it needs the variety of niches in the grasslands in order to hunt for prey, to nest, to hide, all things like that. Since 1970, its population has decreased 75%. And the bird on the right is again, the Northern Bob White Quail, which as I said before, has had a 77% population decrease in the past 20 years. So if we don't make conservation changes now, these trends are just going to continue on. This is where the American Bird Conservancy and GRIP comes in. GRIP stands for the Grassland Restoration Incentive Program, and it's a program that the American Bird Conservancy works on with multiple different partners. The, they partner with different private landowners to allow for restoration methods in Texas and Oklahoma. So they use a variety of different grassland restoration methods. Two of the most popular are prescribed fire and mechanical shrub removal. Something interesting about grasslands is when they're in their healthiest state, they're at an early successional age. So when you let grasslands grow unchecked, but with human control, they'll grow into forests. Naturally, grasslands would burn down pretty regularly to reset the successional timeline. So allowing for prescribed fire really helps to do that reset. The GRIP program has helped restore over 85,000 acres of land in the past seven years in Texas and Oklahoma. So they're doing really great work, but unfortunately they don't have a monitoring program in place to really fully understand how their restoration methods are impacting the landscape on a longer term. So this is where I come in. Um, my main goal for my research is to create a methodology that will assess grip restoration um, practice effectiveness. And I'll be doing that by looking at changes in structure of the landscape and also changes in productivity um, to get a better understanding of the long-term impacts of grip. To accomplish this, I'll be doing a before and after comparison of grip plots in Northern Texas that have primarily had prescribed fire restoration methods imposed upon them. Um, I'm still figuring out the exact remote sensing metrics that I'll be using, but um, one will assess primary productivity, another will affess, affect, assess structure. Um, the reason that I'm still figuring everything out is that a lot of remote sensing work is done on uh, landscapes like forests, but grasslands are a lot trickier to understand because of the size and scope of them. Um, so a lot of my research this summer is also just going to be figuring out the best way to do this to get the most complete answer. Um, and my goals are to provide the American Bird Conservancy and other conservation partners with answers as to how well they're doing. We want the population trend of this graph to start going back up. We want more bobwhites to come back into the Texas grassland systems, but doing work without checking how well it's working isn't super effective. So I hope to be able to provide them with some answers that can be applied to both the GRIP sites, but also conservation sites more widely as a whole. So thank you.
Um, I see there's a question in the chat, which was similar to what I was going to ask. Do you think um, your work could be generalized to be um, applied to other countries and continents to suggest best management practices in conservation? That's my hope. Um, something kind of interesting about this is that most other ways that people have assessed grasslands is by going out and collecting their own data specifically. What I'm working with is like Landsat data, stuff that's readily available. Um, so my hope is that my methodology could at least be applied um, and we'll get a better understanding of how different restoration methods affect grasslands. Thank you so much. All right, we'll move on to our last, but certainly not least, present presenter. Um, Kelsey Wright will be presenting on developing story maps for otter conservation. So Kelsey, go ahead. No. Okay, hello. Um, <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Kelsey Wright. Um, I'm an environmental science and policy and public policy major. Um, and I'm excited to tell you about my project where I made story maps to support otter conservation. Um, I worked in partnership with River Otter Ecology Project um, and my mentors were Professor Rose and the co-founders of ROEP, um, Megan Isidore, who's a William & Mary alum um, and Terrence Carroll. And I wanna thank all of them for this opportunity. It's been really, um, really fun. So to begin, um, what is River Otter Ecology Project? So they're a small nonprofit um, based in the Bay Area in California, um, started in 2012 with a mission to engage the public in supporting conservation and restoration by linking river otter recovery to the health of our watersheds through education, research, and community science. Um, so my work focused on their community science project, which is called Otter Spotter, which is kind of self-explanatory. Um, so if you see a river otter, you can go on their website and submit your sighting with photos and videos. And over the last nine years, they've gathered thousands of sightings, um, each of which is represented by a point um, on the map on the right. And they've used these sightings to create a more accurate range map for river otters. But previously, there was no resource or website that fully told the story of otter spotter and how the range map has been created and changed. So that was what I was trying to do um, with my work through story maps, which are an interactive tool um, to tell stories with maps, uh, media, and text. So the broad goals of the story map are to introduce people to the work of River Otter Ecology Project and River Otter Conservation more generally, and to spread awareness about otter spotter. So for viewers in the Bay Area, um, part of the goal is to show them that river otters are in their neighborhood, in their backyard, um, and conservation is relevant to them, even if they live in an urban or suburban area. So the story map tells the story of otter spotter site, otter sightings um, for, from the people who saw the otters themselves. Um, it demonstrates how ROEP's work has updated the range map for river otters and describes how the data that they produce is used. So um, the first section of the story map is otter spotter stories. So as you scroll on the left, you see where the sighting occurred um, and a blurb of text from the uh, otter spotter themselves. And then on the right, you see a series of photos um, or a video uh, from the sighting. So here's a fun one. Um, it is an otter facing off against a coyote um, at Point Reyes National Seashore. And there are nine other uh, sightings highlighted in the story map. This section also, also details um, etiquette for when you see river otters. So like, what do you do? How close can you get to them? Um, so that's valuable information too. So the next section of the story map um, is otters on the move, and it chronicles how the range map has changed. Um, so before they started their work in 2012, the most recent range map was from 1995, so it was almost 20 years old. Um, and Megan and Terrence, the founders, knew that the range map wasn't accurate because they'd seen river otters in areas that weren't covered by the range map. Um, so as I said before, using the sightings, they were able to update the range map um, to the map on the right. Uh, in 2019. So in my story map, I have a swipe feature so you can slide back and forth to compare them directly. Um, here, you can just see them side by side. But as you can tell, the range map has changed a lot. Um, so the next section is who uses otter spotter data. And I go through 10 different like groups of people, professions, parties um, who use the data, including toxic spill preparation and response teams, um, watershed managers, land managers, educators, um, wildlife rehabilitation centers. Um, so here on the right is a map of tanker vessel traffic in the San Francisco Bay and crude oil railroad routes. Um, so if there's an oil spill, it's either going to be on land or on water. It's going to be 
kind of concentrated in either of these areas and it's valuable to know where otters are in comparison to that. Um, so for each of the different groups, I have a map um, or photos that represent them and then text about how the data is used. All right, um, so I'm currently still finishing up the story map um, and I'll be teaching Megan and Terrence how to make updates on the map once I'm no longer working on it. Um, and then once I'm all finished, it'll be embedded in their website and they're planning to use it in their educational programming um, with their grants uh, in general outreach. So hopefully people will see the story map, they'll learn about otter splatter, and then if they ever see a river otter out in the wild, they'll know how to behave and they can submit their sighting. And the River Otter Ecology Project can then use their sighting to change the range map and advance conservation. So um, if you're interested in learning more or seeing my story map once it's up in a week or two, um, you can visit riverotterecology.org. Thank you. Um, so how did you select um, which stories to feature in your story map? Um, so I did it with, with Terrence and Megan, um, but we kind of picked some of the most exciting ones, the ones that had the best photos. Um, so there's, there's a river otter that's lived in the San Francisco Bay. So we had that one. Um, we had a river otter with an eagle, um, just like some of the really cool ones. Um, yeah. You went for the captivating factor on those. Um, all right, well, this uh, comes to the end of our 2021 Geospatial Research Symposium. Um, oh, Rob, do you have a question in chat? Well, uh, one of the partners, uh, Terrence Carroll, is here. And I just wanted to pose a question to Terrence just to ask a little bit about the relationship and how this is supporting their efforts around otter conservation, if he wouldn't mind answering. Uh, thank you, Rob, and thank you, Kelsey, for that excellent presentation. Um, what Kelsey is helping us doing, a, a big part of our work is engagement with the public so that they understand that everyone can and, and should be a conservationist, including in their own neighborhood. And so Kelsey is helping us with the engagement part. Um, and in particular, the otter spotter stories, what she's helping us do is draw a direct line from the personal experience of each observer to the larger conservation impact that their particular sighting had. And, and that's the exciting part for us. Thank you. It's great. Story maps, um, speaking from my experience, have really um, become grown in popularity um, from my perspective in the past year. And they're a great way to convey information to um, both science and non-science audience and make um, your topic more engaging to the general public. Um, any other questions at the moment? Well, thank you all again for attending and presenting. Um, it's been great um, to moderate this event um, and I've really learned a lot from all of your research. If you are not involved in research with the IOC or the CGA, um, email the IOC or the CGA um, to get involved. We're happy to um, help you do some research. Um, but I wish you all the best and thank you all for coming out today. Ooh. You beat me to it.